Hi, this is Scott and Tay from Backstage Community Forum. Hi, yeah, uh, we just got done uh, going to the Art of Guitar Studios, and we sat down with Mike G, uh, also a guitar player for Sanctus, and we uh, had a really great interview with him. It was really fun. Yeah. I, I had a lot of, I had a, I had a blast. Um, good friend of ours. Subscribe and like if you like this video. So here's the video. Is mm -hmm. when I do this. But I put on my new high tops all for nothing. Nice. Well, you can, we can take a minute and just I'll go do the moonwalk. <laughs> just can straight. I moonwalk like across the screen to start the <laughs> If you know how. I, I saw an instruction video on how to do it the other day. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't understand. You know where people go wrong with that? Is I've been breakdancing since I was like nine, you know? Really? Yeah, I went through a phase. Actually, uh, my friend just gave me that whole bunch of cassette tapes right there. Yeah, I saw that. Look Guess at that what group. came with it? The Beat Street soundtrack. Really? It was like discovering gold. But the problem with break uh, the moonwalk is everybody does the wrong thing when they do it. Like they lift their leg and then they scoot back. They lift That's the their way heel. that they were just describing it on the video. Yeah, they lift their heel, then they slide it back, lift their heel, slide it back. It's slide, then lift. Yeah. Slide, then lift. That's the secret to life, kids. Well, I think we got enough. Then. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I didn't know that. I, did, yeah. I mean, when you drop that kind of knowledge, where can you go from there? Exactly. You know? so to, to hang out with us, you have to be able to do the moonwalk correctly. You know? I, I don't know how yet, but I'm working on it. I, I did Darren's dance group, so I do know how to do the bye-bye-bye <laughs> dance. <laughs> so I remember the bye-bye-bye dance. That's yeah. right. Ain't no lie. Bye-bye-bye. Yeah. You know what? It's a good workout to just dance in your bedroom. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's like I got in this weird habit. I started... There was a YouTube channel with this guy dancing, and he was like had a group of people behind him. So I just mimicked what he was doing, and it took me through halfway through to realize it was like a Christian dance. So all the songs were about Jesus and stuff, but yeah. I was like getting my groove on. I'm like, this feels wrong for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like thr thrusting Especially my when hips. You're dropping it like it's hot, exactly, and thinking. <laughs> Which I should do today because it's Easter. So maybe some Jesus grinding would be good. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounded bad. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, thanks for letting uh, us come here and shoot this here. It's, it's I, pretty like I cool. said yesterday, it's more me being a control freak than me being generous. Hey, hey it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so, and Tay's back behind the camera yes, over there you. again. The third camera. Running the tri cam. Yep. Um, with the pack next to her, the VHS tape or whatever you stick in. <laughs> it's laser. Yep. It's on direct to laser disc. <laughs> so she's got this like turntable looking thing. Wouldn't that be funny? Oh, there you go. Did they ever make, <laughs> actually make, you couldn't record onto a laser disc, could you, on your own? I don't think so. That would have been crazy. That would have been the greatest. If they would have done that, that would have killed VHS. Yeah, I, I know things went on behind the scenes because there was always like Betamax versus VHS, that war. And then there was something else. Um, I Mini think LaserDisc. Disc and CD. Okay. Because LaserDisc was just a bigger version of uh, a CD. Yeah. And when people see it, they can't believe it's real. They're yeah. Like, that was actually a thing. I remember my ex girlfriend's dad had T Terminator 2, Terminator 2 on the LaserDisc. It, it was like in heaven, you know? I, um, I picked up at the uh, Goodwill. 30 they were like laser discs but they were karaoke discs and they were all in vietnamese no and way yeah they i sold them in my store they went like hot cakes because they use them you know, so wait the, it's you put it in and it's actually a karaoke type thing it's a, it, it requires its own machine yeah to but run. these these are like karaoke stars like some mm. of them are autographed and stuff like that it was crazy they have karaoke stars yes oh, uh, over in vietnam okay and so but yeah somebody bought i mean like all of them they wow. all sold it was crazy just wondering if they like you know sold them on the black market after that or something. <laughs> like I can't believe he, he doesn't know what he has. You, yeah. you ever do that? You go to a garage sale. Well, you do this like you know this oh, stuff. Yeah. That's... And you kind of do all the double take. Like, did, are they really selling that? You know, rare copy of Thriller for two dollars. <laughs> I don't get that lucky. Oh, okay. I did buy a brother word processor for right. nine dollars. Oh really? I think I saw it. Yeah, the picture that I Aiden, think so yeah yeah, and it actually works. It wow. really works. It has a floppy. You yep. put it in, and then when you turn it on, you hit pr you decide whether or not you're going to want to go to, which took us a while because it's like, what button do we push? Because yeah. it's basically a typewriter. Yeah. But then you can print it, and it prints off on the typewriter. <laughs> How does it print off? It comes out of it? 
You put the paper in the typewriter like you would normally put in a typewriter, okay. and you hit the print command, no and it way. actually feeds it and prints the page that you're looking at. Because we're process. I, I go all the way back to when I was a kid. My dad had one of those hammer typewriters where he actually had the hammer keys. Oh, yeah, manual. And so when you yeah. got done, you had tendonitis every time. But I used to <laughs> sneak in his room and type out Kiss lyrics, I remember. <laughs> so I, that's how I memorized Creatures of the Night. And all that okay, stuff. good. That era, not the. Yeah. Okay, because no, some yeah. of those Kiss lyrics at, at eight, eight years old would have been pretty bad. Yeah, so. it pretty much. Um, I don't know. When I was a kid, I didn't. I, my brain couldn't figure out. And then as I got older, I was like, all these songs are about love and sex. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, duh. Did you know that every song is basically about that. <laughs> Suddenly everything made sense. Like ACDC songs. Like, oh, that's mm-hmm. what they mean. Shook me all night long. Okay. I get it. Oh, Kiss, really? Kiss songs, you know. Uh, obviously, let's put the X in sex. But like Love Gun. Yeah. <laughs> you make me rock hard. When I was a kid, I was like, oh, they mean, you know, you make me rock and roll. No. Oh, you're yeah, rock. The, <laughs> like, I was thinking, thinking buff. I was like, it's not steroids. I get that all right, the time. Exactly. It's not steroids. This is just clean, healthy you sure? Living. No TRT or anything? No, nope, no, nope, no enhancements. This is all just me. No red light therapy? <laughs> no. You don't do anything? Yeah, it's a real thing. All right, so what are we talking about? Here? Well, you know, I just thought that we'd kind of just talk about you mm. a little bit. Um, so uncomfortable. I'm so used to being in the band setting. I where know. You're shares. so used to being in all this other stuff. Yeah. Um I'm better one on one than one on two because I did that one with Domitian, and it was hard for me to keep. Focus. Oh, I watched that today with the two guys. Yeah, it was time. hard for yeah. me to keep focus, and I wouldn't. You're no good with threesomes. I take it. No, I'm a, I'm a monogamous kind of guy when okay. it comes to I get it. What? <laughs> yeah, we did uh, 13 people at Perkins today, and it was really hard because you're you yeah. want to connect with everybody. You're sectioned off, right? Yeah, you have to and if somebody person. starts talking to you, it's like, oh, I'm missing something over here. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, like, this one-on-one thing, mm-hmm. it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, I started the channel because of you, so which is good. So, I figured I wanted to have you on. Ted was Ted ended up being first. I wanted you to be first, but okay. Ted's... Ted was first. Ted was a good interview. Great did you go? Guy. Did you go remote? Did you say, or did you do it at your place? That's at my place. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yes, I own that saloon. I life. love it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it looked familiar, but I swore you said you're going remote for your first one. But anyway. I was going to do that with uh, Marco James from okay. Morticia, um, but he uh, got sick, mm. so we get, yeah, so we canceled that one out. So that was we'll. Uh, I got a lot coming up, which is kind of cool. I got a lot of people that, that'll be coming over. I got Dewey from Mirage coming over nice. next week. He's writing a book about music from the I think Minneapolis scene. I heard about that. Yeah. Like somebody got a hold of me and asked if they could ask me a couple questions. I don't know if that was him. Probably. Okay. Him or his son, his okay. son Keith. I felt bad because I was like speaking for the whole band, but I mean, <laughs> I try not to be too weird, too weird about it. But it's it, going to be interesting. I, I I seen the the first draft. It's, okay, it's really cool. I like it. I like it. It's it's kind of like if you know, it's kind of like Encyclopedia Metallium, but it's okay. like you know what I mean. It's did you guys get your own page in it too? I got two pages. The one for each page. Nice Snafu and Animosity got their own page. So. I want to go down the animosity rabbit hole someday when we're talking about you. You know, we'll do a reverse interview someday. I want to learn about all that crazy stuff. Too. Oh, yeah. We got to get Chad in here, though, because Chad is remembers everything. And he has vi- uh, pictures and video Okay, where I don't. Okay. Uh, so she had all of my lyrics handwritten. When we got back together, so she held on to him for twenty two oh years. Oh my god, that's that's dedication. No, that's pack ratting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's those kind of things that'll last forever, though, in your mind. You know, mm-hmm. I can still remember writing stuff down. Yeah, you know. Well, I thought about this the other day when I was watching Little House in the Prairie. Um, there's an episode where Charles is like making desks for some reason, mm-hmm. and he always puts his brand on it. And in the episode, they fast forwarded to like 1983, like modern times, and they were selling the desk and his brand was on it. And I'm thinking, you know, when everything melts down in the future, all that's going to be left are like stone structures. (laughs) And if you could get things etched in stone, they could last forever. So I may have had a drink or two that night, but I woke up (laughs) a couple days later and Amazon package shows up. I I bought a... um, stone carving kit like the chisel thing yeah, like the at chisel. the beginning of the movies and tv shows that come yeah, like that exactly. really? <laughs> and i remembered ordering it i wasn't you know yeah crazy but 
what I did that evening when I got it, I was so excited because I had all these tools, but I had nothing to work on. I have kind of a stone end table in my living room. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just carve my initials in just to practice, you know? And then I realized it was like two in the morning and my neighbors were pissed off. You know? yeah. <laughs> You're shirtless. Kinks. <laughs> Who's building train tracks? Good Lord. Anyway. Oh, geez. I knew our interview was going to go like this. Like yeah, this. it kind of goes off the rails yeah, a little bit. I love um, it. I do got some actual questions that Tay and I were, what we were working on, what do you call that when you're working them together? Um, uh, brainstorming? We were brainstorming, yeah. Okay, tossing, tossing some ideas around. Yeah, we were tossing some ideas around because I was like, I know a ton about you. You know what I mean? So I said, I asked Tay, you know, and she wanted to know, What's your favorite? What was your favorite song to play? Right. Yeah. What's, what's your favorite song to play? Okay. Of all time. Oh, just in general, not Sanctus or anything like that. Not Sanctus or anything. No, just she was just wondering mm. these these. You know, she gave me some some good ideas with this stuff. Yeah. To to narrow it down to one song, I think would be impossible right now. But I could give you like three that I love playing. Three. Two. <laughs> There's um. You know, there's instrumentals that I've always loved playing. Like, there's a song called For the Love of God by Steve Vai. And for some reason, whenever I play that, it just feels like I'm on a different uh, dimension or something. It just puts really? me in a different place. Yeah, it's, especially if you get deep into it and you just start to lose yourself. It's weird when you lose yourself and then you have, kind of have to shake yourself out. Like, oh, I'm playing guitar. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then with the band, you know, watching those videos of us playing live, um, some of those breakdowns, like the song Incomplete, I love that. Oh, that was crazy. I mean, yeah. watching it, because we were on that show with you. That that show? That Yeah, that show, because when they read off the oh, ticket, it was, okay. it, I think it was our farewell show. Because you guys went on, and uh, was Porcelain God the headliner of that one? I thought it was Acheron, because we confused the shows. Al yeah. thought it was the spring break show, but it was actually the Christmas, like, winter show that we yeah i i don't recall i i i, I it makes sense to me last night but mm -hmm. <laughs> today it's <laughs> like i'm losing it yeah everything's so, becoming a big blur yeah and then as far as just chilling you know when i was a kid my dad had a uh, trailer house he just decided he was going to move to the middle of nowhere i think everybody has that phase in their life we're almost there yeah it's like we're, we're sick of all this craziness mm -hmm. we're gonna just move to the middle of mora so he, he moved to mora minnesota and so we'd visit him every other weekend. And back then, there's no internet. We have no, you know. Mm -hmm. So I w was just getting into guitar back then. I had this Harmony Les Paul knockoff. And I would bring that with, and it was the only thing I had to do up there. Because it was basically just a trailer house with a wood-burning stove for heat. <laughs> and if it was wintertime, you couldn't really go outside, you know. It was so crazy out there. So I brought my guitar, and I, brought, I bought Randy Rhodes' Ozzy Osbourne Tribute, the tab book. Oh, so yeah. I learned how to play guitar basically from watching or reading the tab out of the book while I was bored stiff at my dad's house. You didn't have lessons to start? No, I did, but that was, you know, sparse because we couldn't afford them. So oh, it's okay. like if all of a sudden my dad could afford three months of lessons, I would go to Mr. Mark's music in Anoka. Oh, okay. And my guitar teacher, it's funny. I'm not actually, Schmidt, not the Crash Course. No, Al did that. Okay. He yeah. came back. He could play Rocky like a hurricane. He was yeah. in heaven, you know. But I had to go to Anoka, and I just took like a handful of lessons at first. But everything my teacher gave me, I just, you know, tore apart. Like I went in depth as far as I could because okay. I couldn't go anywhere else for any resources, you know. So I had magazines, the Aussie tribute book, and a couple of lessons. It was so sparse back then for, for information that my grandma literally hired her friend to come over. I think she paid him a hundred bucks back then. That's like giving. Which someone, would be like five hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he shows up, and he, you know, he's like, "Yeah, your grandma wants me to teach you some guitar, I guess." You know. And I'm like, "Yeah, I was wondering how Jason Becker does this tapping part." You know. And he goes, "Whoa, whoa, that's that's beyond my my pay this grade." This is a G. Yeah, he's like, he's like that's kind of exactly the way it was. He's like, "You don't know your basics, but you want to play Jason Becker." So he was really wise, and I was just like, all I wanted to do was shred. You know? Yeah. So yeah. he gave me some real good word uh, advice, and he's just like, "You got to slow down. You got to learn these things first, and then all that stuff will make sense." You know. And he's like, "Plus, I can't play that stuff anyway." You know. <laughs> but I was disillusioned. But I like it when you're young and you're excited and you try things just because you don't know the consequences of it yet. You know. So. Mm -hmm. So at my dad's, I would just learn from Tab, and I remember trying to learn D by Randy Rhodes, the classical. Piece. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I play that sometimes, and I just not only. I don't know. I get transported back in time. It's a nostalgic feeling, but it's also a really 
pretty song. So, mm-hmm. oh yeah, yeah, it's one of the, I. He was just we lost him too early. That's yeah, all. I couldn't believe how young he was. I found out and just the plane. The plane the thing sounds weird. They, yeah, like, they were playing tag with the bus or something like that. And, yeah, yeah, like d- diving, nose diving something into like the that. bus. Like who, yeah. who does that? You know, Ozzy's band. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I uh, did. I did see him and didn't acknowledge it when I saw him. You saw him live? I saw him live. Holy. Motley Crue was opening. It was wow. Yeah, and I was excited to go see Ozzy. And he just had some guitar player from, I think, Quiet Riot or something like that. He was like, who's that punk? Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, it was pretty weird to wow. see him actually, and but not to register it and not to have memories or pictures or anything. Mm-hmm. I just know that I was there. So <laughs> I wish I could go back in time to my own body and, yeah, and you know, it. really watch him play. It was a great show. It was a great show, but yeah. So do you remember, like, did he do a solo? Because he used to do... I don't remember anything okay. about him being part of it. I think I was just... It was my first time seeing Ozzy. And I just, you know, I wanted to see Ozzy. That's what I wanted to see. I get it. Plus, you probably saw so many concerts back then. Like, you oh, yeah, there were remember every... specifics from everyone. Dio came, like, at the beginning and end of every tour. Yeah. So you'd go see Dio. He'd, like, have the laser whip. Then he'd have the laser <laughs> knife. And then, he, you know, and he'd have some dragon come out that he was slaying. And, you know, it was... Uh... Then the big finish, the laser pen. Yeah. Just, like, annoyed people with it. <laughs> He's... <laughs> <laughs> He's standing there. He's like <laughs> focusing some poor kid in the crowd. He's like, knock it off, man. <laughs> I can't see. I'm blind. That would be great to be a laser pen to, on stage. Oh, and my God. Shine other people. Just piss st- off your whole crowd <laughs> one at a time. Like, that was a weird end to a Dio show, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the laser pen. You had the you had the rockin' hair. You had, like, totally long, dark hair. Yeah, and it was, like, all, all of it was us all, It was all there. You didn't have the patches like I have. <laughs> 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 the big colic flipping around, you know? Yeah, I remember a few times just getting like, excuse me, ma'am. I was just like, oh, my God, what the hell? But it was all part of it. And then uh, I remember the weird era where bands started to cut their hair, and we did, and we suddenly wanted to be Pearl Jam. You know, it's like, uh-huh. it's okay if you have the Eddie Vedder. It's like up to your shoulders. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, but, and then when Metallica did it. Yeah, that was that crazy. Was, 96 yeah. was such a bad year for yeah. oh, so many things. I thought it was just me, but I think the whole scope of music was just getting it got just gross. it got it got a little silly. Yeah, like I don't know what it's really like. Happened. Oh, you like this song? Well, then you should hate this song now, because it's been fifteen minutes. It's already it's already that's passed true. Its time, you know? And if you listen to like even thrash metal or something, people are like, oh, you're like old now. Yeah, it's like oh, I'm sorry, I'm not listening to sound. It wasn't even Soundgarden. Like we we're already past all that already. Yeah, six was like the start of auto tune and weird things. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, Chemical Brothers and all that were getting really big. I remember. What was it? What was the band that sounded almost like techno? That was a metal band, Fear Factory. I want to say. Yeah, Fear Factory is badass though. Yeah, they Some are. Live. But they had that. That drums are just. Crazy. Yeah, they triggered their drums and their drummer. I can't, his feet are insane. You know, but a lot of bands were going for that. You know, there was like the techno metal conversion. The new metal thing started happening. And yeah. I don't know. I liked it, and so I kind of six. So that would have been like kind of like the, uh, um, not Limp Biscuit, but like you know uh, what's weird is I get two thousands mixed with that era too because yeah. it kind of pushes into it. It's like okay, the new metal, the Static X's, all those bands came a little later, I think, but there were Stabbing Westward and all that stuff. Yeah, and was it Lincoln? Was Lincoln Park back then, Lincoln or Park, or were they? They were in the two thousands too, I think. Yeah, around that time, you mm-hmm. know. But it's funny, there's this other YouTuber that talks about how crappy music got in, like, 97, (laughs) because everything became, like, alternative grunge light. Like, okay, now you're used to this grunge sound. Now we're going to put, like, poppy beats behind it and sing about, you know, like, (laughs) Vertical Horizon and all those kind of bands got big. And I don't hate those bands. It just did get very KS95, kind of, like, adult, like. I don't know. It's the same thing that happened to the hair metal. The hair metal towards the end of the 80s was the same song with different words. All the same people. And that's what happened to that kind of music, too. I think that one, that one started and died so quick. The whole sub pop, the whole, 
it like went. Yeah. Isn't that weird to see? I think after Kurt Cobain died, like so many changes happen. Yeah. And I don't. Yeah. He could, you, you could, honestly, I believe you could take the start of the Smells Like Teen Spirit video being played. 91. Into his death. Yeah. And then. You know what I mean? Three-year period? Yeah, four something year like period, that. And it yeah. just went boom, boom. People ask me, my students used to love Nirvana. It was so cool because actually I could teach them something with guitar in it. Later it became, oh, can you teach me this a video game theme? It's all synth. You know? but, <laughs> um, they would ask me, oh, it must have been so cool when In Utero came out. I bet you just everyone went crazy. I'm like, actually, people went crazy when Smells Like Teen Spirit came out. I remember because bands that should have been huge were getting cut off at the knees like um shotgun messiah do you remember heartbreak boulevard it's one of my favorite songs i don't remember the song but i remember shotgun was, messiah yeah it was on uh, 93 all the time mm-hmm. 93 x before it came the edge or whatever yeah. it became the edge and all of a sudden that kind of music disappeared collective soul like uh no i'm thinking of something else for collective soul but yeah. All of a sudden, Nirvana took over. Yep. And yep. everything changed. And even our radio stations were changing their names and yep. people were dressing differently. And it was just so weird to see how fast it came in. And then the in utero era, it's weird, but a lot of people I know that love Nirvana, they started already falling off the Nirvana train around in utero for some reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had the the live unplug thing that was real hot. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, they really kind of fell off. Um, the... Uh, uh, most of the bands, though, for the hair metal stuff, they'd start. I mean, they'd start becoming grunge sounding. Yeah, they, exactly. Motley Crue did that with the uh, their new lead singer, yep. and then John, you, you did a whole thing on the yeah. the, the Kiss yep. grunge album. Oh yeah, well, Carnival of Souls. Carnival of Souls. Yeah. yeah, that's when that happened. I'm like, wow. You know, Kiss has always done that though, like yeah. the disco era. It's like Kiss always yeah. follows the trends or whatever. But they always have good songs within it. But for some reason, in Carnival of Souls, there was like a couple of songs that I really liked, but I just couldn't accept it at the time. It took me three <laughs> years to listen to the album because I heard yeah. it was a grunge album, you know? Yeah. But I, I haven't ever listened to it all the way through. Isn't uh, that weird? Yeah. Like a Kiss I, album. I have every, almost every Kiss album, and I just haven't listened to that one all the way through, but I think I should. Even local bands, like... Like we we fell for it a little bit. Like we started adding key, you know, synth stuff. Mm-hmm. We were trying to change it up, but it was a weird feeling to be at the tail end of something that was so like awesome to us, and then mm-hmm. have it just die at the time you're peaking. Yeah, it's a really weird sensation, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, that's it's it's tough when everything changes around you and you feel like you got to change. But you know, like I didn't want to change from metal, yeah. so that's why I just quit. You know, that was the end of it for me. It's like, nope, interesting. I'm going to do metal. Um, that's what I want to do. And then you I end up in that funk rock band. <laughs> it's like... I don't know how that ended up happening. But... Yeah. Well, it's weird. Like, I think you could have easily pulled off the alternative thing if you wanted yeah. to. Yeah. Well, that's where it was going. There are there's there's a forty five out oh. the the uh, an animosity forty five animosity incorporated is what it's called, mm-hmm. and it's a forty five. And those songs are both grunge kind of songs. I remember you telling me you, yep. you guys started pulling away or pulling towards that direction a little bit. Yeah, a little too much. For me, yeah. Well, you did kind of the same thing with Modern Day Crisis, though. Who was exactly. who was pulling that? Who was who was driving that boat? What was the? Uh, was I, it all of you, or was it? It's weird because we all knew we had to do something. Because if we kept on that uh, trajectory, we would have just been hanging there. I think for a long time. Yeah. Now the irony of it is, if we would have kept going and got through the entire phase of everything that happened, we probably would have been okay at the end because we held true to what yeah. we really love. Oh, yeah. But we were just at this point where we just signed with somebody and we're like, God, we got to do something that has a little bit of what's going on now, you know? Mm-hmm. And the funny part is we tried and in doing so, we didn't sound like anything that was going on at the time. Like we just had this mishmash of ideas and per- like we weren't getting along in the band like we used to. We used to have one like, so- like, I don't know, solidarity and what we wanted to do and accomplish. And all of a sudden we split into two camps. It was like Christopher and I did a lot of the, you know, behind the scenes jamming together. We were coming up with new things. Al and Corey were kind of more hanging out and being like the party guys, I think, for a while. And so we split off. And even in the studio, you can hear it's totally disjointed. 
we would get done with our tracks, and then we'd leave, and Al would show up and do his vocals. Oh, so you weren't even there in there. Okay. No, it was like a bad marriage ending. Like, the, the mom shows up, then she leaves, and the dad shows up. It was just this weird thing that just felt so... And, and how often, when you started with Sanctus, how often were you guys practicing? I think you said last night you guys were doing, like, every day. Yeah, we were possessed because mm-hmm. we heard we could open for the regime if we got to a certain <laughs> level. So there was one summer, because Chris had the hookups with Dave Yeager through his drum lesson somehow. It was so weird yep. how all that came together. But we we just went crazy that year. And every day during summer vacation, we drove to Chris's house it wasn't hard to do. He had a fridge full of food. He lived on the lake. <laughs> he had a huge house and everything was ours. You know, his parents were off at work during the day. And we would show up and we would just practice every single day. And by the time we got done with that summer, we went from the basement to First Avenue in that amount of time. Yeah. Because now your first First Avenue show, was that that wasn't the entry. That was the main stage, wasn't it? No, it, it was the entry. Oh, was it? Yeah, we did one entry show, and we opened the show. It was the opening the Metal Massacre. And okay. I had video of it, and I wish I could find it because it was the first time we ever had a line of people run to the front as soon as we started. Wow. And there was this girl, like, banging her head and like we stop one song and she's like you guys are ripping or something like that and what we're like people that? like us what's that Sorry, what guys. year was that <laughs> oh, that was you <laughs> i remember because it was um oh the year would have been 92 or something 93 okay. i don't probably know 93, yeah. probably 92 but it opened our eyes to hey now we're playing in the same building metallica played and we're getting a good response and the one thing yeah. I remember most about that show is uh, Corey's bass amp. His <laughs> speaker cable melted. <laughs> and in between a song, he's like fiddling. Corey always fiddles with his amp. But he's just like, oh, my God, nothing's working. And we're like, Corey, we're at the biggest show we ever played. And you're freaking, you know, we, we were too hard on him. But he figured it out somehow. But literally his speaker cable melted. I think he, <laughs> uses, he used a guitar cable or something. I don't know. So you used to practice a lot at Christopher's house? Yeah, like crazy, man. And, you know... What I relate most to it are the albums that came out during that time because it was like all of a sudden Countdown to Extinction came out Mm -hmm. and we would, I don't know, by day we would practice. Oh, Attack of the Killer Bees by Anthrax came out. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was just super fun. But the crazy part is, is we really hit another gear just by sheer will. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, here's a good lesson for any group of people. Maybe not extremists, but <laughs> if you all have the same goal, you can literally like move mountains. It's yep. so scary what you could do with like three or four or five people when you all have the exact same goal, how powerful that can be. Oh, you know? yeah. Moving so, all in the same direction. It's just crazy. Yeah. So if you're starting a cult, you know, no, I'm just yeah. kidding. No, but <laughs> well, I was going to do a cartel. Oh, cartel's good too. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. stay off my turf. <laughs> I watch Breaking Bad and Ozark, so I know. Yeah. We've watched them both as well. Oh, my God. Ozark changed me. Did it really? Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, I'm in love with Ruth, you know, but it just it, it brought me back to these weird roots I never knew I had, you know, like my trailer park roots. Oh, OK. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I started like realizing the true me is a little bit, I don't know, r- ratty. I don't know how <laughs> to put it. But it's like, a little down to earth. I don't know. I spent my whole life trying to like lose that side of me but i was raised in a trailer house you know basically and then moved to you know other houses but it's like that's my origin story right there really yeah i, re- I did I, just uh, like eminem yeah exactly <laughs> you don't know where i came from <laughs> i'm just kidding but uh, i had this thing where um i've been writing horror stories for lately yep. i don't know why but i just feel the need and i have all these scary stories from back then because you're a little kid you know you have this long hallway in this trailer house and Uh, My mom used to have all these Korean dolls everywhere. And so it was good fodder for growing up with that kind of mindset. Yeah, it's good for horror movies. Definitely. The Korean trailer. (laughs) So so you started um, just on your own. Did you do did you do the guitar magazine thing where you learn the song of the month type thing? It's like where everybody's like learning, you know. I have a magazine sitting in my amp over there and it's um, one of the ones that I brought to my dad's trailer in Mora. And what's funny is I had to get I had to glean anything I could off of it. it was like taking I don't know advantage of anything I could that crossed my path and back then it was tab books magazines and my grandma's friend you know basically <laughs> <laughs> and Cal was his name and but he works at uh, Music Connection in Forest Lake I saw him not too long ago I'm like hey you're the guy <laughs> who taught me smoke in the water you know <laughs> but um, it was uh, 
one of those deals where I didn't know how to do pinch harmonics and I always wanted to make the squealy sound, you know, mm-hmm. like Eddie Van, or, you know, like Randy Rhodes or yep. Eddie Van Halen. And so I didn't know how to do it. And there's a article you literally had. <laughs> I was reading this article on how to do it. And this guy's trying to describe it, but you really have to feel it and have somebody guide you. But it's like, make sure your thumb scrapes the sixth string or whatever, the string while you're picking. And so the whole night, I just couldn't get it to work. I did it for like a (laughs) week straight. I never quite got it. And so I had to devise my own way to do it. Like I had to do a cheat way to do it off of the information that I got. This is how far back this is. And so I figured out this like hack of how to make a squeal happen on the guitar. And I made a video of it for my channel, and it's one of my most popular. It's I think it's got like three million views now, or really? something crazy like that. Uh, and everybody who comments on it says the same thing. They're like, it. None of the other like explanations made sense until I saw this video, and I'm like, that's because of all the struggle that it took to finally figure it yeah. out. So I just cut to the chase of how to do it. And so I think it's a blessing to have such scarcity in the beginning sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah. You just alone with your guitar and figuring it out. Now, did you did you always know that you wanted to play guitar? No, I started off wanting to break dance, like we talked about. Yes. Um, I had a lot of hobbies, and I know I have to be on some kind of spectrum or something because even as a kid, I would just get so obsessed with something that I could spend ten days and not eat. You know, I would just like, <laughs> go crazy with GoBots, Transformers, Voltron, and then I, as it got you know, as I got older, I got into baseball and uh, really worshipped, like, the Minnesota Twins in 1987. Frank Viola is my hero. Oh, still. Yeah. I got his autograph ball at home. <sighs> I'd watch Twins, like, playoff games. <laughs> and when Frank Viola would pitch, I would mimic his moves with, you know, throwing the baseball. Really? That intense, huh? Yeah, and one day I uh, missed the couch and hit the, <laughs> the wall. And there's still to this day, like, a crater in the wall <laughs> from the baseball. But what's crazy is that... I got so obsessed with that that I used to pitch a tennis ball against the garage door and Al would come over and we had this like stick that was broken in half. We didn't even have money for a bat <laughs> and we would take turns like batting while the other one pitched and we would hit a home run would be my neighbor's fence basically. Yeah. So we did that just tirelessly over and over again. Every single day we would wake up, he would come over, we would play Major League Baseball on Nintendo and then we'd go out and pitch against the, the garage door. And that year, we both were in Little League, and we both made it to the uh, All-Star team. Oh, and I really? I think it's because we were both so obsessed about every little thing, you know? Yeah. Just wow. re- just pure repetition. A lot of that was boredom, too. Like, we didn't have any, you know, Facebook or anything. Yeah. So having That's no right. internet. Pre-internet. Having yeah. no computer, we just all we did was, like, go outside and throw a ball against the freaking <laughs> garage door. <laughs> but it got us really far. And then after that... Uh, you know, all the breakdancing stuff, karate, martial arts is another huge thing. Yeah. If I didn't do guitar, I'd be martial artist right now. I'd probably be, I'd probably have my own school. That's really? That, yeah. that much, huh? You, uh, you primarily do jujitsu or what is it? Started with just basic karate, taekwondo. Okay. And then when I saw the UFC for the first time, I saw Hoist Gracie and mm-hmm. I saw that taking someone to the ground and choking them out is way more effective than trying to like kick and do tornado. <laughs> I always thought it was like Karate Kid where you could just do fancy stuff. <laughs> and I'm lucky I only got in one fight and I judo tripped a guy, I remember. This was like fifth grade or something. <laughs> and then the other kid came at me with windmill punches and I just sort of <laughs> got out of the way, but he hit me in the back really hard and made that real f- big that thud. thud. Yeah. yeah. Boonk. And then I looked, and he had his two older brothers behind him. So I'm like, even if I beat him, I'm dead. You know? <laughs> so I remember I was going to cr- – I almost started crying. I'm like super sensitive kid. And I just like walked away. I'm like, oh, whatever. And so, yeah, that was bad. So I got way into self-defense after that. I really wanted to learn how to fight. And I got to like blue belts, and then my mom stopped paying for – karate lessons oh gotcha you know? but my grandma would take us to, you know it was like a family thing it was really cool and then later when i got into jujitsu i was older so i was like you know what am i too old to do jujitsu so i started going to the school in st louis park called warriors cove and i did it for 15 years and i'm just oh really yeah got to it's funny i got to purple belt which is pretty far in jujitsu there's only five belts but um man i popped a rib to this day my rib sticks out right here i don't know if you could see it No, I can't see it. But but, I used to use it like in side control. I would dig it into somebody and just be like, but it was kind of scary when it happened. I was rolling with this cop. A lot of cops do jujitsu. Yeah. And he, we're, it was like 
20 minute roll. We're just like going all out. We're both sweating, both dead. And at the very end, the timer goes off and he does one last jump onto my side. And I just heard crunch. And I thought, did my rib just go into my lung? <laughs> and I was afraid to take a breath because I thought I was going to feel the piercing. You know, <laughs> oh, no. I went to the bathroom. I had the cold sweat. And I reached out. I'm like, oh, my God, because it was way sticking out, way more before. And my friend, this is just jujitsu ju- 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 uh, mentality. He goes, just you know, take a back wrap, you know, the back brace wrap, and just tie it around for a couple of weeks. You'll be fine, you know. <laughs> so I never went to the doctor. And this is what oh, I, you. <laughs> So for the rest of my life, I have a third boob. It, it, it reminds you, it reminds you of not to fight the cops and the yeah. Jiu-jitsu. Don't don't fight back when it comes to cops. Just, <laughs> actually, I should have fought back. Maybe I don't. Know. Oh, I yeah. fought the law and the law won. So you did that for what fifteen years? Yeah, that's pretty cool. And still to this day, I want to go back, but you know, I, I kind of tweaked the bottom right side of my back from playing guitar. Actually, really? um, yeah, like jujitsu, I popped my knee once from my heel. It was just a lot of weird little things, but. In the end, it was practicing guitar for thousands of hours that kind of messed up the bottom part of my back because I'd twist funny when I practiced and I'd watch like TV while I practiced. So it's like (laughs) never twist and stay this way for too long. (laughs) Always be straight if you can. Have you had any back surgeries or anything like that? Or Never had a surgery. I'm very fortunate. Knock wood, man. I grew up sickly. You know, I'm actually going to talk about this in a video soon. But the reason why I'm so into fitness and being healthy now is because I grew up, my mom smoked when she was pregnant with me. So I came out, you know, asthma, eczema, all these allergies. You know, I was behind the eight ball right away. And so I spent a lot of my youth going to the doctor and hospitals, like emergency rooms, because I'd wake up and I couldn't breathe. And one time my doctor gave me penicillin, not knowing I'm allergic to it. I am too. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It's, it was all these weird memories of how crazy life was back oh. as a sickly kid, you know. So now I really focus on trying to be healthy, you know. Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu was a big part of it. But, you know, still to this day, trying to do yoga, just trying to stay flexible seems to be the key. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you're obviously been keeping yourself in good shape. Yeah, did you I'm, see us doing a little bit of... I saw some dumbbell pulls last night. Corey started it. I wasn't going to go there, but all of a sudden Corey's like, I could do 60 curls. I'm like, try to do 10. I wanted to see you do the push-ups with Al sitting on your back, but you didn't oh do it. Oh, my I put God, it up that would have been awesome. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm building up. I'm getting back, so. <laughs> yeah, so what? why metal? Why did you get into metal? When I was a kid, like super young, my cousin got me into Kiss. Mm-hmm. And so that was my introduction to like rock, hard rock. And when you're a kid, you're so susceptible to kiss because blood, explosions, kiss alive. Smoking guitars. Smoking guitars. It's just everything is like a comic book, you know. So I couldn't – I just listened to Kiss Alive endlessly, and I would draw pictures of them on stage. I really didn't <laughs> – all I had was the cover – like the album cover to go off of and a couple solid gold. Remember that show? It's a couple solid gold appearances. Oh, okay. Where they lip sync. You know? oh, okay. Is that that was around the Dynasty era, wasn't it? That was I think so. 79, they came out and 80? Did, they did um, – Or was uh, it the World Without Heroes, the Elder? I remember the, the Elder time. That was a weird time. It was around that time. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do a video on The Elder, and I'm defending it. I don't care. There's some great <laughs> songs on that. Yeah, that back then, so I was into Kiss, and then it felt dangerous as a kid. Like, oh, like, you know, because back then. You draw then we, on your folder. You draw the Kiss yeah, logo. Yeah, Kiss logo. Yeah. All, yeah. And then, um, you know, it just got to the point where I listened to Kiss for so long, and then I got into anything they were playing on the radio for a while, because that's all we had, you know. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, my cousin comes over. <laughs> I'm like 12. He comes over with this weird looking cassette with the statue on it. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And all of a sudden he's like, you don't know what this is. I'm like, no, that looks cool though. He's like Metallica. Like, yeah, heard of him. You know, my, my friend Al's brother has ride the lightning or something. You know, I saw something about the electric chair or something <laughs> and he puts it in. And all of a sudden around that same time, the one video came out on MTV. Oh yeah. And that I was, was a just, pretty crazy video. Yeah. I was Trent. I just couldn't get enough of it. I recorded it and I would watch it over and over again. And then one day at a school dance, some rogue DJ plays blackened. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all dancing to like Bobby Brown. I'm not dancing, but I'm just trying to like. <laughs> You're swaying. Yeah, I'm trying not to get beat up basically <laughs> back then by bullies. And all of a sudden, Blacken kicks in. And I thought they were saying, I'll beep that out. So it was like, in, but it did it. I'm like, whoa. And then the bridge kicks in and it's 
see your mother put to death, see your mother die. <laughs> it's really mother, mother earth they're talking about, mother nature, whatever. But I thought they were talking about like someone's mom. I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> this is at a school dance, you know? And so that was already like in my brain when I saw the one video. So I kind of put the two worlds together. And the next thing I knew, like I had to buy that record. And my stepdad, Tony, who did all the recording video, video recording for Sanctus, he was big into vinyl. And he's like, you know what? You might want to actually buy the record because you could dub that onto a blank cassette. And then anytime the cassette wears out, you could just redub it. So it sounded logical back then. Oh, yeah. So I bought the Ride the Lightning and the Injustice for All vinyl back then at Musicland. Oh, wow. Yeah. At Musicland. Musicland, yeah, before it was Sam Goody. And I... And I worked there eventually, but I put on the record and black and played. It was already etched in my brain a little bit, but the end part, when it builds up. And the drums change. I got this chill and I say, ever since then, my DNA had been altered. <laughs> so after that, you know, Columbia house, I got into that. I did oh. a video on that recently. Where I ordered all these thrash metal band tapes, you know, Overkill. Okay. Uh, just, oh, nice. I even ordered a sampler back then called Doomsday News 2. Do you remember that? No. Had all these like Norwegian metal, death metal. Oh, it was really like cool. Mayhem and stuff like that? Or? Yeah. I'm trying to think of the bands, but it was really a cool look into all these other bands that I would have never heard of before. Gotcha. And yeah, it was just really cool to all of a sudden hear Overkill for the first time. Yeah, Overkill is pretty cool. Yeah, I always wanted to open for them. That was the one that got away. We never quite opened for Overkill. But still could. My students' band opened for them. Really? Yeah, I'm like, oh, what a weird twist of fate, you know? Yeah. We never got to, but our stu- it was at, um, I forgot the venue, but a smaller venue in Minnesota. So it was kind of strange. Yeah, well, they, they played recently, didn't they? Yeah, they just released something. It's actually pretty good. Yeah? So... But so you start the metal stuff. It's you and Al. We, you know, if watching your channel, you kind of know that you started out on drums, and then you moved. Steel Rage. Yeah, <laughs> you and Al just started making music, and then you found Corey and Christopher, a, a younger year of your school, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were grade lower than you guys. Yeah. And then, um, you. Was it the talent show that got you guys started, or what was that? Was this? another DNA altering moment for sure. But yeah, okay. early on, it was so cool to have your best friend be into the same thing you're into. Oh yeah, and actually, that's why it makes you best friends. <laughs> yeah, it really. Otherwise, he may have gone off and tried to do baseball, and I would have tried to do break dancing. <laughs> you know, it would have been a weird pairing. But I think we would have split apart a little bit. We lived two houses down from each other. You know. Oh okay. So it was weird when he moved. We met in. He was in second grade, and we were on the swing set. Sorry to go way back. No, you you you've known him that long. Yeah, and he was the new kid, and I was pissed because the girl I had a crush on suddenly like the new kid. You know, the new kid. In town. Did he have the hair? Did he have he the, had, the poofy hair? At no, that he time? didn't quite okay, yet. No. Did, uh... He did have the nose ring. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he walks in. I'm Alan Douglas. I'm from oh, from whatever city he was from. Whatever you. But anything new in my school was cool. You know, oh, yeah. the new kid. And all of a sudden, I was like, ah, whatever. You know, because I saw my girlfriend looking at him or whatever. Even back then, second grade, I was like weird about it. But I was on the swing set. During recess, and all of a sudden he sits next to me and goes, hey, man, you, you listen to the radio? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, what do you like? It's like, Kiss, what do you like? And he said, Duff, I don't know what he said, what, something his brother listened to or something. And so we started to, like, swing with each other. It was weird and something. But <laughs> That's how it all started. Yeah, it all started with swinging. And then uh, we started, like, singing Turn Up the Radio while we were swinging. <laughs> yeah, so we're like, and then uh, after that, it's funny because he got into guitar first by taking the crash course Yeah, and he'd bring his guitar home. And I was like, I got to get into some music, man. This is cool. Cause we were both getting into Metallica at the same time. And my grandma bought me this drum kit. It was like a toy kit, yeah. aluminum. It was like the crappiest thing ever. I didn't have cymbal stands. So I used lamps. I had a <laughs> lamp here and I put a symbol on it that I got at a garage sale or something. And yeah. I hit it. They didn't have the internet back then. You yeah. couldn't just order it from musicians, friends. Yeah. There was no Amazon or anything. So I literally used my, my lamp. Yeah. And we would do demos together. So we'd play like little parts of songs. So here's five seconds of In My Darkest Hour. I have cassettes of this for proof. And Al didn't sing or anything like that. We just jammed. And then we'd put on little concerts. And then I decided I wanted to ditch the drums. 
And it, my drum playing, uh, as far as the, with that kid ended, the day Al came over and sat on the kick drum and it went to the ground. He just oh, he smushed, he smushed it. it. Yeah. He laughed for like two hours after that. <laughs> and then uh, got into guitar. My brother bought a PVPA, you know, I always talk about that, and a Les Paul knockoff from one of my sister's boyfriend's friends who used to come and hang out. They were scary to us back then. I got gotcha. you. And he's like, yeah, we're in a band called Crystal Axe. That was like everybody had a cool band name, but they didn't really have a band, you know. Oh, <clears throat> and he's like, "Yeah, you want to buy my my setup?" And for 150 bucks, my brother got both of those things, you know. Really? Yeah, and then he, my brother, would play it for like five minutes and then go go out with his friends. So I started picking up the guitar and just trying things out. Next thing I knew, I was playing one, like the beginning to one. <laughs> and That's I just our son, honestly, that is what our sons, not our son Hayden, but our son uh, Austin, our older son. Every time he comes over and picks up the guitar, he ding, plays ding, one. Ding, and he ding. knows and that's his song. Nice. And he knows, yeah. It's just this gateway. If you want to keep going, that's a great way to get in for some reason. It's one of those deals where, you know, it just seemed like it was pushing me towards that direction. I couldn't stop it. Yeah. And then Al came over and we would just play guitars, like dueling guitars together. And we decided, you know, we got to go further with this. We were. It's good to start out with two people. That is like the core of the band. And we put out the word at our school. We started asking people. We found this singer named Matt. We thought he was a singer because he looked like uh, Robert Plant. <laughs> and he wore jean jackets, but turns out he really couldn't sing, but he looked cool. <laughs> so he came over once, and uh, Corey has a different version of this story, but uh, you know, we all started jamming together, and we tried peace cells, and the guy couldn't sing at all. So Al would sing behind him like he's playing rhythm guitar and i could hear al singing way better than the guy who's supposed to be our singer. <laughs> so i'm like al why don't you just sing you know or he decided one of us decided that he should just sing and who knew you know he could yeah. sing like that over time and Corey and chris knew each other but it started off with chris bullying Corey. like he used to like <laughs> christopher yeah chris was in the popular crowd he was a tennis boy Tennis boy, he lived off the lake. He had all his lake friends, you know. So, hey, we all ride in boats. We all have jet skis. We're cool, you know. It's so, so hard to picture him that way because he's so down to earth now. Yeah, back Either. then he wanted to be Tom Cruise or something. I don't know. <laughs> so we would come over and we felt like sewer rats, like going into this mansion or something. And all of a sudden, like his parents were well off. Very cool. They allowed us to practice at their house. Yeah. They're so cool. And Chris's mom bought all our t-shirts and his dad bought us a PA when we had to use one or we needed one to play a show. So they were very supportive. But man, it was such a different world to all of a sudden walk into Chris's world. You know? Yeah. Well. But I always thought it was just hilarious that our bass player and drummer started off as enemies. <laughs> and then when Corey joined the band, he's like, I know this drummer, you know, we, we, we used to fight each other, but he might do the job. <laughs> it's through metal. Metal bonds. Metal united so. us. Yeah. And then Chris eventually became the ambassador for keeping it thrash metal. I have to give him credit during the modern day crisis stuff. He wanted to stick with what we were doing. He was, him and Al mostly, but... It's like the rest of us were kind of like, we got to change. We got to do new things or whatever. And he wanted to stay metal. So yeah, what a weird turn of events. Like the guy who was the most reluctant to get into that stuff. He was into like Poison and Bon Jovi and stuff when yeah. we met him. He liked other things too, but was the one that wanted to stay metal throughout all of it. So. Yeah. I, th I suppose because drummers, it's really hard to get up to that, being able to play at that speed. Yeah, you didn't just want to throw it away. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, I've invested way too much. <laughs> I use both legs, man. Yeah, I'm not going to just play even flow now. Give me a break. <laughs> yeah. So when you played First Avenue, did you think this is where Prince played? All did you hit, Did you hit. take that in? <laughs> I did yeah. that too. We're yeah. lucky we started in the entry, so it wasn't that huge of a revelation at the mo in the moment. Yeah. Um, but it got to the point where once we got on the big stage, it's like walking up those stairs yeah. and being like, it's not as massive as I thought it was going to be. It's taller, though. It's very, yeah. I know. In this, you're afraid if you're buzzed, you're going to just take <laughs> just the wrong ball, step. Yeah. Ball off that people, thing. I don't know if people know, but there's that huge, like, um, 
barriers. So like the people have to be way away from you, but there's the barrier causes a big, there's a crevice. Like you could easily just step in there and, you know, smash your face in it or something. But luckily um, we were up there and I'll I'll never forget our first time up there because we were so green Mm -hmm. and we're doing sound check. And I look back and Chris is ghost white. He's like, I can't hear anything back here because he kept screwing up. We're like, Chris, even in soundcheck, we don't want to suck, you know? And then all of a sudden, um, I forgot if Chris just said something, but the sound guy goes, hey, do you guys want anything in your monitors? <laughs> Chris is like, everything. <laughs> it's almost like the guy hit one button and all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> hey, there you are. And all of a sudden, Chris is like, he has a whole new life in his face, you know, he's smiling. And from there, it was just like easy street, you know? It, how far did, how, what was the road to getting to, because I kind of, consider first avenue main stage is like you got where you need to be yeah yeah i mean you, you've you've done something pretty significant at this point in time. Yeah. did you have to play a lot of the skunk shows prior to that or i think we were kind of pampered in a weird way but we did pay our dues if you yeah. look back we have a photo album behind you and al wrote down every date of every show which is cool yeah nice but our first show you know we played birthday parties we played a girl named uh, lisa she she rented out the VFW or the American Legion in Coon Rapids, and we played you know played our best. We sucked, but it was like for all the popular kids. So all of a sudden we're a bunch of freaks playing for like nine oh two one oh you know. <laughs> and uh, I remember because one of the popular guys got in a fight that night, and the whole crowd ran off to see if he was okay. It was just so weird, but we were just happy to play. Then we played another popular girl's party in her garage. Her name was Hope, and it was cool. And then we had a place called Rock and Roll Unlimited in Fridley, and that was our you know, was it like a younger crowd? It was, was it yeah. like all ages type thing or something yeah. like that? Yeah, it was like, I think it started off as like a religious hangout for people, like a church okay. place. But they had a stage, they had a guy who ran sound, they actually had a PA system. So we got a couple gigs there, and then we ended up playing there like 10 times. It was how we cut our teeth, you know. And it's really funny because we played the Halloween, the Blizzard 91, when it was like oh, 20 really? feet of snow. Yeah. And Dean, you know, our manager, he had a huge van and we barely made it to the show. We get there. We set up. We didn't know any different. We just thought we had a gig. We have to play it. Nobody's there. It's like totally empty. They even made this like terror maze. It was really sad. They really tried to make this a special night. But they didn't know it was going to like snow 20 feet or whatever yeah. it was. And so we played to nobody that night. But the tenacity we had to still go to the show and still follow through, I think, speaks to the rest of our future. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, we might as well rock out. I think we made it and one other band made it. But back then, there was like Postmortem Grinner was a band. Oh, yes, remember them? I PMG. remember those guys. They were kind of this weird like mentor band for us okay they used to come over to my house a couple of the guys and i was always very just scared around them like those are real musicians you Mm -hmm. know next thing you know we're playing shows with them and it was just really weird to see you know the trajectory of both bands like that that's where the ryan's probably comes from yeah ryan a lot of ryan stuff so i would say playing after the mirage with the regime we felt like we were on top of the world already but we still played the Tuesday nights at Ryan's. You know, we did all that stuff. We ended up opening for Nuclear Assault at Ryan's, which was a huge dream of ours. And I think one of the best times of my life was leading up to that show because we we love Nuclear Assault in a weird way. Like, we got into their newest album, actually, called Something Wicked. We're like, we're going to open for these guys. And Chris had bought a Jeep at the time, and he had our logo on his back tire, you know, his spare oh. tire. And we would get in, and we would drive to his house and have band practice. And so it was such a cool, special time, you know. But, yeah, so I would say paying your dues, playing Ryan's on a Tuesday night for nobody, led us slowly to getting the confidence to going, plus that summer of practicing our asses off, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Everything all ties together. Yeah. It's funny when people don't have jobs or girlfriends, what you can accomplish. No <laughs> offense. I'm just saying, back then we had nothing. So yeah. it's like all we had was the music and the yeah, band. Yeah, just had each other, and yeah. you had the world that you had to conquer. Yeah, come to think of it, when things got complicated during the alternative phase or whatever, everybody started, like, getting different, I don't know, like, they had different commitments all of a sudden. You know, you mm-hmm. get older, and, hey, I got to make a car payment now every month. I have yeah. to pay for this. I have to do this. Al had three jobs, whatever. Just the jobs get in the way, and it's just like there's that special time when everybody had free time that... Yeah, I think we took just advantage of it. Gelled together. Yeah, because yeah, you guys' trajectory was pretty quick as far as I 
have heard and some of what I remember is that you guys were playing Ryan's when I first met you. And uh, it was like me. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan's Just on bouncing. like a Tuesday night, you yeah. know? And, uh, Yelling free bird. But yeah, but then you'd have like the Mirage show was... That wasn't even like two years later, and yeah. it was like you guys pulled in like eight hundred some people over there. It was crazy. We just that we video fed off that the you showed us crowd usually, but yeah. Oh yeah. It was well. no uh, remember steeple. Oh yeah. There's no steeple crowd, but Tony. Yeah. But the Tony thing is, Brett. is like you're right, and you told me some things I didn't know. I didn't know our manager was like not strong arming, maybe but like getting us like better spots in the show. He was just firm. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't doing anything. I mean, he was looking out for your best interest and, and yeah. he wasn't, he wasn't doing it in a way where he was being mean or anything like that. It was just like, I think the, that the boys would be better in this spot here. And, and then but he had that look in his eye, you know, he's a well, tough dude. He, he, he would tell, <laughs> yeah, he, he was kind of, I mean, but he was, I mean, he would come across just as, you know, I'm, you know, looking out for their best interests and, and everybody just kind of agreed with it. You know, I mean, that was, it was. It's it, almost like you don't get what you want unless you ask for it. And he had no qualms about just asking. I think. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, how about we put these guys in this spot instead? I'm glad Instead I didn't. of having them headlining. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. put them down to the second one. I remember that with me because I, and I hate headlining. Headlining was too much pressure. I hate headlining, but yeah. I, we headlined after you guys and oh my God. We were so wasted by the time that we got on the stage. <laughs> That's another factor. Yeah, yeah, time is a factor for sure. Yeah, yeah. But it, uh, it's weird when I find out all the behind the scenes that happen. I just focused on getting on stage and doing my best. And yeah. all of a sudden, oh, yeah, you guys had this. You had Dave Yeager pulling the strings. Mm-hmm. You had all this stuff. And I'm like, so much goes into a band. Like when a band just appears to make it big, Mm -hmm. there's something behind them. Usually, you know, people just don't get there on their own merits of being a great band. It's like, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of master of puppets going on, you know, with the Oh yeah. Well, you had Jim Mahurl loved you guys from Coup de Gras. That's so cool. You had, um, uh, the regime liked you, which is great. Both two powerhouse bands. Oh my God, the regime. We had, worship them. Yeah, you had Dave Yeager, yeah. who was in the ear of every club owner and every promoter. I remember going into the caboose and he goes, Scott, come over here. And he sits me down next to this person. He's like, This is the person that owns the caboose. And I was like, Hi. Wow. <laughs> How you doing? I'm an animosity, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? We never, never had, uh, I think we did play, maybe we didn't. I don't remember. But uh, I just, that was Dave. Dave would go to every bar and get to know every owner. And it, with Darlene at the Mirage, yeah, Darlene. same thing. But he was in your corner strong too. You know, what I mean, so thank it's God, like, Chris took those drum lessons, man. Because I think he met Dave through that, through whatever place. He, he, he would was. have been in your corner either way. Yeah. Once you guys started playing, because your music was so tight. And I so just feel awesome. bad that I never thanked all these people back then. Like I do now, I try to say it as much as I can. Oh yeah. But I really should have went up to Dave. He was in the audience at that Mirage show, and I just you know give him a handshake and say thanks for everything. So. Oh yeah. Well, it's, I think yeah. he, I think he enjoyed what he was doing though i mean he liked the people and he liked looking out for it's good other people and you know he had that that thompson's drum shop where he had that you know and it was uh him and todd worked there todd from Remember swinging todd. teens and dumpster, dumpster juice, juice. He was like everyone worshipped him as a drummer with the hair. Yeah, you know, and, he and, and like we he had the twin brother that when he was in Swinging Teens, it was. Oh really? I yeah, he has a twin brother. I or at least they look a lot alike. I think they're twins. I don't know. I almost forgot about Swinging Teens because you hear that name, you think it's going to be some weird type of band, but they're pretty heavy. Yeah, from what yeah. I remember. Yeah. Yep, yeah, they were part of that right. Uh, I guess kind of later replacements time frame. There was like this Babes in Toyland, grungy metal. Run, Westy, run, you know. I'm really shocked. Yeah, it's funny. Run, Westy, run, run is still around. Mm-hmm. My friend Peter's their drummer. And it's like, you guys are doing albums still? This is great. But I don't think Minneapolis gets its like um, credit for having the grunge before the grunge, you know? Yeah. Like, it was, if you listen to like even Dumpster Juice stuff. <laughs> Yeah. 
That's mm-hmm. some of the most grungy. I don't know. I remember going even to the Metal Massacres, and there was a band called the Game Hens. Do you remember Game Hens? Oh yeah, that Holy was Pierce. Cr- was, uh, Jeff Pearson was the singer for that. Yeah. yeah, and I remember just his voice and his power. <laughs> that, that big it, it, yeah. <laughs> Freak me out. I'm like, they're called the gay men's. What the heck? <laughs> First thought that, oh yeah, it was one of those weird moments where you don't know what your scene has until it's gone. Oh, absolutely. And then you're like, man, we had something really visceral here. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, like uh, in like 88, 89, you could go uh, see Slave Raider, you could go see Soul Asylum, you had Prince, you had uh, The Time. You, you could had probably see him at the Run West You Run, and, Tiny Bar, yeah. Yeah. Yep. You had Run West You Run, you had um, uh, The Mighty Mofos. That yeah. was another oh, band. You had from, Ipso okay. Facto. Yep, Ipso Facto. Trip Shakespeare. There's just so I many. I love those bands. old City Pages ads where you see Ipso Facto on every page. It's like, yeah, man. oh, Wayne is so awesome. A couple of bands were Wayne like that. They were awesome always guy. playing. Mary's Rest was always playing for some Now, reason. he, the singer from Mary's Rest, ended up starting Hairball with Chainsaw. Oh, really? Yep. It was I those two singing. Connection. Yeah, it was okay. the singer from Mary's Rest and the uh, Chainsaw. Wow. Yeah. See what I mean? Like these bands push and push and push with one thing, then they jump to another track and sometimes they go huge. Yeah. Like how that's awesome, man. So that kind of brings me to the next thing is okay, so Sanctus is over, Modern Day Crisis is over. Do you go right into another band? I, or do you. And I know you did some studio stuff, too. Did you start working with Christopher on his studio, or was that still in Modern Day Crisis time? Well, during all that, Chris and I kind of, I don't know, we just joined forces when it came to studio stuff, because we were both nerds when it came to, uh, com- you know, anything that was audio related, we got into. Like, yeah. I got into keyboards and stuff, and he got into, he had um eight track reel to reel, and he bought a board. He really got into the recording side of things, you know. Yeah, I remember when he moved to ADAT. ADAT was a big move. Yeah, and then he bought three ADATs, and then he upgraded to the newer ones. But it was such a big thing to to see him, and he taught me everything he knew. So everything I do right now for my channel, it's because Chris showed me how to do the Pro Tools stuff. And oh, really? My grandma helped me with the video side of things, but yeah, all that stuff. So I would just sit in his his basement because I was depressed. It was like ninety six, ninety seven. And he had, like, his girlfriend would be over. They'd be hanging out because Chris had that huge house in Anoka. They had a pool. They had a sauna. They had a pool table. They had everything. So he'd be hanging out with his girlfriend, and I would just sit in the studio and feel depressed. It was probably the most depressed I was ever in my life. <laughs> I remember listening to Enigma 3 and Tori Amos, like, on <laughs> infinite, yeah, infinite repeat. And it got to the point where I was just, like, the only reason I was still living is because I could go to Chris's studio and just do whatever I wanted to. So I would, like, take taxi driver on vhs and i would dub the dialogue onto <clears throat> recording stuff and i would make like a soundtrack to it i would just experiment you know and then i like did some solo stuff but that never really wasn't really what i wanted to do ultimately you know but i was learning the trade of how to make things sound good and eventually my friends asked me to join their country band actually which is kind of funny really and i hated country i was just like no i don't want to play country i'm a metal guy and I ended up joining and playing gigs with them, and that's how I became an alcoholic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> playing Garth Brooks all night. Behind stuff. the chicken wire. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But it got to the point where I was like learning how to play shitty gigs again in a country cover context. And we're playing outdoors. We're doing rodeos. We're doing weird shows, you know. So yeah. I'm actually writing a story right now about like breaking down in the middle of nowhere, going to one of these gigs, you know, but it was, it was a good learning experience, you know, yeah. kind of just trying to make money actually to pay for the, you know, pay my car payment at the time. But when did you start teaching then? When? Oh boy. Okay. So I started teaching actually my friends when I was 16. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So my <laughs> friends would come over and I would just show them some stuff, but it was nothing official. But then I got a little bit older and I just kept, you know, one-offs. I would teach a few people here and there. But it wasn't until I went to Schmidt Music in Northtown. Oh, yeah. That was one of my favorite jobs ever. Where I started to think, hey, I could actually start showing people, like, teaching. Because Rick was there, the guy who did the crash courses. And he said, yeah, man, you should get into it. And so I started to do it actually at my house first. 
I had like five students that would come over every week and oh, I was really? so flaky back then. They would sometimes show up and I'd be gone. Like I, I was so <laughs> all over the place. I like forgot the day I taught lessons, you know, so I was very unprofessional. But that led to wanting to teach more professionally. And then um, when the band broke up, I ended up ha- having uh, the worst job of my life. I worked overnights at a gas station. Oh, yeah. I've and it was so bad too. that I watched the newspaper guy come in at 3 in the morning. And I go, hey, how much do they pay to deliver papers, you know? And so I took the job at Pioneer Press. And so oh, okay. talk about the worst thing to do when you're depressed. You're in your car all by yourself at night, <laughs> listening to Tori Amos, throwing newspapers, Enigma. wanting to kill yourself. It was bad, yeah. But from there, I knew I had to do something. So I always passed by Schmidt Music in Brooklyn Center every time I did my routes and stuff. So I decided this is my last th- chance. If I'm going to go there and ask if I can work there, not teach, just work the counter or whatever. Yep. And if they say no, I'm just going to drive off a bridge or something, you know? <laughs> and Keith Carls was the manager there, and he's like, oh, you worked at Schmidt at Northtown? We have, like, a revolving door policy. When can you start, you know? <laughs> so I taught the sales or the floor for a while selling, you know, band instruments and some guitars. And then eventually I talked the lesson coordinator lady into letting me have a couple students, you know, once a week. And I went from that to suddenly having 50 students, you know, after a little while, 50 students every week. and just Holy, never every stopped. week? Yeah, 50 students a week. And it's funny because I was so green back then. I was making the least amount of money from all the teachers, but I had the second most as far as a roster goes. <laughs> and the day I learned that, I'm like, that seems weird. And the lady's like, you should raise your rate. <laughs> You're worth at least 20 bucks a half hour. You know. And I thought I was like in the money. It was like 20 bucks a half hour. Holy crap. So in like two days of teaching, I could make what I would have to work all those overnight shifts, you know, to, to have the same amount of money doing what I like to do. Yeah. And that's when I started to learn what it took to be a good teacher, be dependable, you know, showing up helps. (laughs) It's the beginnings. Came up with the, the curriculum of the first lesson. And it's funny because I taught that first initial lesson so many times that I've like carved away at it and, all those decades go by and I ended up, you know, now it's my number one video on my channel. You know, it just hit 11 million views. It's like you go from teaching all those people one at a time to having 11 million people watch your lesson. Mm-hmm. It's pretty. Yeah, that's insane. pretty darn cool. Yeah, I still don't believe it's true. <laughs> oh, this is like some weird alternate reality. Or yeah. Something, you know. Yeah. It, but yeah, teaching was just a natural, I guess, uh, next step for me at the time. And so you started at Schmidt doing that, and then when did you uh, – you, you ended up with your own studio at one point in time, right? Yeah, it got to the point where I was at Schmidt for over a decade, and I was in a tiny room, probably the size of this rug. Right the here. green ones? <laughs> tiny, but yeah, it was they're more yellowish, but they had a yep. green tinge to them. We had to move those once. Oh, my God, to take them apart and move yep. them. Yeah, yep. weird. And it got to the point where, you know, every day I'd go there and I started looking at how much I'm paying the for the rent. And I'm like, for that much now that I have like 60 students a week, I could probably pay rent in a different space and have my own freedom to do things, you know. Little did I know all the other crap that comes with starting your own thing, you know. I learned that the hard way, but it was great. I remember finally deciding and telling everybody, I'm out of here after this month. And they couldn't believe it. They're like, you'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be back. So it was one of those things where I had something to prove. Like, I really have to just make it, you know, make it work. And so I had the first, you know, location and barely made it every month. I barely scraped by. I was like, I'm not going to be able to make rent this month, you know, so... Luckily, the phone calls came in when they needed to, and I just truly feel like something's always been watching over me, you know, like giving me the right things I need at the right time, you know, not spoiling me, but Mm -hmm. saying, you know, you're going to get through this, you know, even if it's barely. Yep, we know what that's like, don't we? (laughs) So, yeah, I think the teaching thing really was a necessity for me because... I got to the point where I was like, this or I'm leaving this world. You know, it sounds so dramatic, but at the time, you know, that's how I was thinking. But I thought some weird intervention happened or something, and all these doors opened once I took the leap of faith to try to do what I really wanted to do. Because I was raised to never believe you could do guitar for a living. That was just a silly idea. So it's like, how could I do what I want to do? And, you know, because I tell people, even if I didn't have this channel, I'd still be doing these kind of things on my own. Like I, yeah. like when I made the Taxi Driver soundtracks and all that stuff, I was just doing that for Chris. You know, Chris is the only guy I would hear. <laughs> now I can upload it and thousands of people can hear what I do, yep. you know, so whatever it is. but And then also, this is weird, but 
I got into like self help for a while. I really went deep into that stuff. And Chris and I were playing pool at his rich house, and I saw this like collection of CDs on the side. It was his mom's stuff for her work, and it was like Tony Robbins. Oh, Tony Robbins is awesome. Well, when I was a kid, he used to have his infomercials, so I thought it was like some fakes. I was like, you know, it came on after the Dianetics commercial and all that stuff, so I thought it was kind of weird, you know? Yeah. And I always thought, this guy is too smiley, too perfect to believe, you know? But <laughs> as soon as I started listening to these CDs that Chris let me, he just loaned them to me, um, I started, started to think differently. I'm like, oh, I never thought that is a way to think, you know? I always thought... This negative voice that holds me back was like reality. You know, he's like, oh, you could change that. Here's how you do it. And it's all these weird techniques, but it actually worked. And as soon as it got out of my own way, I noticed like a whole bunch of things opened up. So whatever he did, <laughs> every time someone suggests a self-help book to me, I look at the overview of it and I go, oh, Tony Robbins did this 20 years ago. <laughs> See, I have the CDs right there actually behind you. <laughs> really? See his big smiling face? It's on the floor, but it, you oh. probably can't see oh, it. Oh, yeah, there he is. Isn't that funny? It's literally right behind you. Yeah. Well, but you keep it close to you because it's important. It is. And, you know, it sounds kind of trite, like, oh, self-help got me through all this stuff. But it's just how you think. Mm -hmm. I grew up just thinking so shitty. Like, oh, yeah. From negative. school, always being scared, always, yeah, negative, thinking everything's going to always go wrong to being like, And hey. if it doesn't, you got to find a way to make it go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you always get in your own way. So I found out that I was my own worst enemy, like the song says. And yeah. once you become your own friend, not in a way like I went too far, you know, I was like, oh, thinking I was all really bad, bad shit, you know, for a while. <laughs> but it was only because I was so far the other way that the pendulum swung really far and I was almost hard to get along with. You know? <laughs> I don't ever remember you being at a point where you were hard to get along with. I was, and ask Chris. Chris saw the worst of it because I was like full swing the other way, and I was like, anything's possible, which was good. I needed it. <laughs> but I remember one time we were at Chris's A440 Studios, and a whole bunch of his friends were there, and I was just like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And Chris is like, dude, you got to cool it. You know? And like, you okay, you're right. You're a little so, over the top. Yeah, Chris has always been like my... Weird, weirdly spiritual advisor of how to be, you know? He's like, dude, you might not want to talk like that in front of people. He's your moral clock. I'm like, I'm going to own this whole building someday. And Chris is like, ixnay on the... Chris has always been that. And I think I really could fly if I really tried. Yeah, I'm going to... If I flap these fast enough, I can do anything. I believe I can fly. But it, it's just weird how, I don't know, you could go from this to this in almost no time like uh, you ever it, do something one day like clean your entire basement and go i did all that in one day like what else is possible if i really just you know tried i just looked over my wife like no that's scott's never, never scott's <laughs> never cleaned the whole basement in one day no oh, now you have to no I, <laughs> but it's astonishing you know like the other day i just upgraded my whole website in one day because i just freaked out i was like you just sick of it down and did it yeah, yeah. it's like wow i could have been doing this the whole time but some information could change everything. It's like your brain wiring could be altered at any age. Even if it's just somebody saying good things to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that's that that might be what it is and you, you know, cuz the world is going to tell you all the negative things about Definitely. you if you let it listen, if you listen to it. Yeah. But it teaches you, yeah. Oh yeah, and then you got to you got to be able to bear the storm. I think that's the biggest difference nowadays. It seems like they want to protect you from the storm, but mm -hmm. if you're in the storm and you survive it and you you know you're strong enough to survive that storm, it's really hard to knock you off your feet after you've gone through that. Yeah. But I keep thinking of that saying, you know, about it's better to uh, wear slippers than to carpet the whole world. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I love it, that. When it comes to it, it feels like, man, I was raised to, you know, get through the tough stuff and then I appreciate when I get to the other side. Whereas if I was always coddled and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, everyone's giving you accolades no matter what you do it's really hard to improve because you think you're already there you know we were talking about that with sanctus the other day it's like mm -hmm. our step my stepdad tony he would tell us when we sucked you know he was really brutal about it yeah. and there's ways to do it you don't have to be a, a jerk you know yeah. but he did it in a very caring way and i'm like i think that's a really powerful thing is to be able to weather the storm and, and mm -hmm. get better from it well and you you know you went both feet into the music industry yeah. i mean when you when you jumped in and 
I did as well. I was I was in school. I was in college, and I was manager of a gas station. And really, I, I got the call from the Animosity guys, and they said, "Hey, do you want to be the singer?" And I go, "Okay." <laughs> quit my job, quit college, went both feet in. Moved back in with my parents. Wow. Went both feet completely in. That's dedication. And just yeah, well. It, it pays off in the end. Look it, what happened. Like you had to, I keep telling people there's a leap of faith. When I say faith, you don't have to think of it as God or anything, but it's mm-hmm. just, you have to, everyone I know who is doing what they love in life or has a situation they love, they had to take some sort of chance, some sort of leap of faith. For me, it was just, uh, you know, go to Schmidt, and almost beg for a job and mm-hmm. say, this is it. This is, I'm putting all my chips on this plan. Mm-hmm. I don't know what would have happened if they would have said no. You know, I don't think I would have <laughs> driven off a bridge, but who knows? Um, but think of all the things that are good in your life. You know, I think of even back when I was a younger guy and I was trying to like ask girls out. I was always so afraid. And I thought about all the situations that had worked out. I had to have the courage to go up and actually ask. Mm-hmm. Like It's like life won't give you something unless you pay that toll of taking that chance or really just trying, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, like what they say is, you know, maximum risk, maximum reward, yeah. minimum risk, minimum reward, you, you know? I learned that when uh, I started having students come in and they weren't getting any better. And I'm like, what? <laughs> did you work on anything? You know, for after a while, I got so numb to their excuses, I didn't care anymore. But the one thing that stuck with me is when my students started saying stuff like, well, I don't like to practice because when I practice, I sound bad and I suck. So I don't want to feel that. So I just don't practice. And I go, I hate to tell you this, but to get great, you have to suck so much. You know, you have to embarrass yourself. You have to feel that pain. That's the payoff is getting past it. And they couldn't see past, a lot of them couldn't see past the pain of sucking. Yeah. Like you just picked up the guitar. Do you really think you're going to be awesome? Like who's teaching you this stuff? You know, I've been sucking for 25 years. There you go. <laughs> Look at me now. Still suck. Still sucking. <laughs> But if you resign yeah. yourself to a lifetime of learning and sucking, you're you're always going to be growing, even if you don't oh, see yeah. it. The forest from the trees is very tough, you know. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. It's and so you've been, God, you've been teaching forever then. Uh, Three decades. Yeah. Wow. So I learned so much about people. I think that's the weirdest thing is I learned the most about guitar and people through face to face, twelve students a day six days a week. It was just one of those weird things where everybody has a different personality. You have to learn how people learn and how not to push people the same way. You know, people Mm -hmm. think it's all one method, but it's like, you know, it's flexible. Yeah. Because everybody's got a different aspect to them. And if you watch one of my old videos I uploaded called, uh, this is what teaching was like before cell phones. Every student is so individualized. They're so different from each other. And I'm afraid, you know, I don't teach private anymore, but at the end, the tail end of my teaching, everybody was kind of becoming, yeah. if I had my phone on me, this person staring at something, you know? Oh. Uh, and they'd be like, oh, we going to start? Oh, yeah, hold on. They put their phone away, but they were still thinking about it. Yeah. That so phone is everybody a became, thing. yeah, it's like a homogenized group of people that were coming in. And the only people that had personalities that I could really vibe with were like the older people who didn't get raised through that chaos you know so it's just really i shouldn't say chaos it's almost the opposite of chaos like older people were raised through chaos so they became a little more interesting i think (laughs) whereas a lot of people are watching the same you know reels and you know tiktoks it's just like we're all saying the same stuff now well just with like your your um your fixing the band or what is that what it's called fix this band fix this band yeah it's a polarizing with something like that yeah those are kids. Yeah. Those are kids that are like all in. Master of puppets with no vocals in front of your entire school. Talk about, yeah. Oh, my, talk about balls. That youthful, I'd, what would you call it? Naivety. Just to do it no matter what. Oh, yeah. We're going to go up. We don't have a, let's say we don't have a bass player. Like I was talking to my friend Mike. Uh, he's like, yeah, we went up and played without a bass player because we didn't have one. So yeah. we still wanted to play. <laughs> and I said, I was actually going to go up and play one on drums with a boom box next to me because nobody else was in my band in the very beginning. You know? <laughs> Thought no one else is going to do it. Well, he wasn't going to be part of my crazy plan to play <laughs> one without a band. So I was like, I don't care if I have to be up there by myself with a boom box. I'm playing one. And I've seen videos of kids doing that too. Oh, like, yeah. They do it with what they have, you know. So I, I really respect that. That was, but I mean, 
need to have four kids yeah. from your school. I was I, I I watched that that Master of Puppets one like three times, and I was like, these guys. This is this is what I love about music. I love it about still exists. It's, it's it's that you can see right into a passion. Yeah, you know what I mean. You can see it because even if it's not the greatest, it's still the greatest. It's, it's almost punk rock in a way. Like they they're raw. Mm-hmm. They're they're kind of all over the place, but there's that youthful spirit that's oh, just so. Well, and you know the drummer couldn't have heard anything. Oh yeah, I know. With those little tiny amps in front, so uh, he had to just do. He had to just yeah. play. I'm playing the song. I'm going on into keep Master, time. You is, better stick with yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's pretty yeah. darn good. He commented on the video actually. Oh, did he really? That's the funny thing about doing these videos nowadays, uh, whether it's a high school band or Marty Friedman, you know, Megadeth, <laughs> they watch these videos. I don't know if somebody is just gets it to them like hey check this out somebody did a video on you so i i half of my brain is kind of scared when i do a video on somebody i'm like i hope i don't screw up their techniques first of all (laughs) but i also you know i don't it's not that i don't want to offend them or whatever because sometimes i do people go hey dude actually this happened and then i you know i have to retract something but the drummer's like yeah we actually broke up since that master puppets thing you know but we're all still doing music you know oh, who okay. knows we might get back together you know there's all these hopeful things about it but yeah. i'm like you guys got to stay together man you got to give it a shot just get you know and they did they they had a original they put up on youtube and stuff oh so really it was pretty yeah. good actually so well, okay, so this is what my take is on that particular video with that band is the drummer kept it going with probably not being able to hear hardly anything yeah. at all. The um, And the bass player did as well. The bass player was just going and sitting until he knocked his cord out like oh he said, God, talking yeah. about losing the cord. I knew it was happened one of these days. Yeah. And uh, you had the one guitar player, Showman, and you had the the down and dirty guy that was uh, what was he wearing like a a Ramon shirt or <laughs> yeah, something? Yeah, Ramon's kid who you couldn't hear. Yeah, but he was going. Yeah, he was just. I mean, like seriously, he was like the driver. Yep. And then the other guitar player was like the guy hanging out the window. You know <laughs> what I mean? And, and then the bass player and the and the drummer were the guys pushing it down the road. It was a team effort. A lot of and good. I loved watching that video. That was great to watch. I I just love if they would have had a singer. How much? I mean, the crowd still went crazy, which is great. Oh, absolutely. And they're always going to have that great memory. And my favorite part of the video is the very end. When the crowd's cheering, especially that one girl, I don't know if it was a girlfriend of one of the guys, but she's just like, get up, get up, get up. And all of a sudden, they're done, and a th- I think a realization h- hits them. They're like, what do we do? They just stand there for a second. Like, <laughs> do we walk? And so all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I guess we're done. They start shutting off their gear, and they're going to walk off. But there's that one moment where they're all together, and it's just like, I think that's going to be seared into their brains forever. Oh, yeah. that mo- it's like the Rocky moment, you know, when the arm is up. Like, yeah. <laughs> or the, or, that's Breakfast or Club. We should have learned a second song, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a backup song? <laughs> I always have a backup. If, especially if you go right to Master of Puppets. You would think there'd be you a lot of easier there. songs. You're starting that as a stepping off point. It's a lot a pretty, of, you know. Once again, that youthful naivety. Like, we did that. We played Rock and Roll Unlimited. Like I said, that one place where we sucked so bad. Guess what song we played? Hangar 18. Oh, really? Megadeth. I, could, I can't even play those solos today. I probably can. But it would take me a long time to get those down now. And I was get playing that them. muscle memory back for that. Yeah, thing, yeah. One year into guitar, I'm trying to play Hangar 18. You know? <laughs> but another band played Tornado of Souls, I did a video for, and they had a girl singer. And I thought, this is great. They're finding ways to still make it happen. And yeah. that tenacity still exists. They just have to have the space to do it. Yeah. And uh, I guess maybe the right parenting or something i don't know yeah well and music's so split now too i mean yeah, I, we had a radio station growing up and so you heard what everybody else heard you know and so it's like oh i like this song it's yep. you know that's and we could all communicate that idea yeah, yeah. you hear the new 38 special yeah <laughs> <laughs> yep i like Here's that bon you jo- chose 38 special sorry that's going way that back was, that's really good though it's really good so the the um Teaching drove you to uh, the YouTube, or how did, how did that all come together? Because I remember I hadn't talked to you in years, and I saw your YouTubes. Um, this is before they took off, and I just remember watching. It. It's like, hey, there's Mike. I get to watch Mike from my, you know, <laughs> doggone it, the dial up going. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> AOL, sign me on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so how did it turn to the YouTube thing? How did that transition make? 
happen. Well, it was really weird because I had a student who's a grown-up student, and he was like, we should do some sort of like guitar lesson website or something. So we started it, and it was okay. It was like a good start, but it was tough because I'm like a night owl. I love to work. Like I do my best stuff at like 1, one o'clock in the morning. And I thought, I can't keep bugging somebody every time I get a weird idea, you know, because for me, it's all about inspiration. If I get an idea, like when I had the artist series idea to cover all the different guitar players, Mm -hmm. that was something I wanted to do. And I just couldn't seem to get the ball rolling with another person in like a partnership. I'm not good in a partnership for some reason. So that eventually ended. And then I just started like uploading, even before that ended, I started uploading videos of like my students playing like Iron Man or something. Mm -hmm. And I had my own channel for a while that was just under the school's name. And I would do stupid little things, just like, you know, fun things that weren't really serious, like for a Mm -hmm. channel. Everything's awesome. Everything's cool if you're part of a team. Justin Bieber Infinity Ring. I'm just gonna go right into it. So if a student had a funny thing or if they played a guitar solo well, I would showcase them and then I would put the link up so the parents could watch it and stuff. So it really started like that. And then I just had this idea, you know, like what if I just tried a informational video and do what I do in lessons every day, but just throw it out there in the world and see what happens, you know? And I remember the I started doing like song lessons and I had this series that was super crappy to title it this but it was like you're probably playing this song wrong that's kind of the (laughs) the premise of it so my first one was smoke on the water the second one was enter sandman you're probably playing enter sandman wrong i'm then i taught it in the video wrong okay i remember that one i remember those videos yep and i put it out and i remember the wrath of the youtube commenters came after me and it's the first time i woke up to like over 50 comments and it was like dude you're not even doing it right you know what a douchebag, you know, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and I got that feeling inside, like that nervous, like, what are you talking about? You know, I've been playing this. I've learned out of the tab book. It has to be right. Uh-huh. So this guy sent me a link. He's like, check this out. Watch James play it live. <laughs> and the video was just, you couldn't disagree with it because it was a close up of his hand and he was playing it with like his middle finger and pinky. And I go, oh crap, you know. So that's when I had another crossroads. I'm like, I could either leave it up or just del- quietly delete it in the middle of the night, my video. Like, it never happened. <laughs> or I could just say, hey, everybody, I screwed up. Uh, here's how it really goes, you know. And at the time, I didn't really have too much to lose. I only had, like, a handful of subscribers. So I'm like, I guess this is the end of my YouTube like <laughs> life. This is it. You know, this is how it all ends. And I put out the video, I just called it retraction video. This is how it really goes, you know? And in the video, I just kind of laughed it off. I'm like, you know what? I t- my video was called, you're probably playing this wrong, and I was playing it wrong. Here's how it really goes. Like and I, it Yeah, well, you would think so the way it worked out, which is weird, because all of a sudden, I woke up the next day and I was waiting to see zero subscribers. You know, like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Why are we going to follow him? Instead, doubled subscribers, 100 comments. I was at Barnes & Noble going through each one, like with my, holding my breath, you know, I was freaking out. Every single comment pretty much was like, good on you, man. I can't believe you admitted you were wrong and you tried to fix it. Respect. I'm subscribing. Wow. Um, I've never seen somebody admit, you know, to something like this before. I want to follow you from now on. It's just like, what the hell? So that is what really got the ball rolling for my subscribers to start growing. Mm -hmm. And I... Yeah, and I thought, what a funny video to have that happen with. You know, you you would hope it was like you shredding something awesome. Exactly. Everyone wants to follow him, but it's through the back door, you know. It's just being humble, you know. Just being you, being you, you know. And that's well. The sad part is, is I could have easily went the other way too, out of fear, like another leap of faith, I guess, you know. But I couldn't sleep at night knowing I had a video out there that was wrong that I could have fixed, but I. My ego wouldn't let me fix. I couldn't live like that. You know? It's like listening to a song that you record where you hear your mess up over and over yeah. and over again. It just, that stays right there. You guess know? what? The way we had to record back in the day, you couldn't go and redo anything. It was like, it's there forever. You know, mm-hmm. there's parts in Sanctus demos that are still wrong that we have to live with, you know? Yeah. The cassette recording. I mean, I, I do like that noise though. I do like, a, I, I do yeah. like a little hiss in there. I get it now. You know, there was a point where I wanted everything to sound great and awesome as best as it could be. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what's actually more important than that is character. Character Mm -hmm. is what gives your favorite recordings their own identity. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So you you pop in a Sex Pistols album, and the kick drum might suck. You might not even hear it, you know. But the energy of the music, and like you said, the hiss of the tape, mm-hmm. all the issues with the gear back then, all kind of creates this. It's a sum of its parts. It's like comes together to have its own character. And I'm hearing less and less character these days, not to sound like the old guy, yeah. but a lot of people are sampling their drum sounds. And so it's all triggered. And so a lot of kick drums sound the same now. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to like feel like songs are individualized now. Yeah. And, I, and that's why I like that video that you did so recently with the the kids that were playing that song. It's that was all just heart coming, yeah. you know, that There's was, there was no expensive gear coming through that. You know? No, that was, yeah. And I like seeing that because you do see so much of this overprocessed, you know, I'm going to pick this person to do this with this person and we're going to have yeah. this person write their songs. And so calculated. Yeah, exactly. You would never have a bust nowadays. You'd never have a rush yeah. nowadays, you know. That's why I did a video and I was obsessed with watching Boston Live back in the old days, 79, okay. I think, because it was so crude in a way. Mm. And it was like they were playing live and everything was going wrong, you know, all of a sudden. Yep. You know, um, but then they show the newer Boston. It was like 2014 or something. Mm -hmm. And everything's like computerized. Like they have the back screen, like going in sync with everything. And it's perfect. It's still great. But the rawness of back in the day is like the real. I think we're going to hunger for that more. The more AI takes over everything, Mm -hmm. we're going to want to go back to the days where we have, you know, physical media. That's why I have VHS, VHS is laying around. I'm like, if the internet goes down, I'll just pop in child's play and watch it, you know, and it, it's mine. It's weird. Like that feeling of ownership makes you feel grounded into this world. Mm-hmm. seems a little weird, but people say money can't buy happiness, but I feel grounded when I walk in here and there's a Tales from the Crypt playing on a DVD. Oh, yeah. I go home and I have everything on my PS5. It's all in the cloud, you know, it's all like digital things coming coming at me. And as soon as that goes down... You feel lost, you know. So I love the feeling of having the backup. The playing. physical media, yep. Yeah, yep. and I kn- more and more people are going that way. You know, there's always the hipster vinyl people, and you yeah. know, it's coming back to benefit. That's good. Them. Keep it keep it coming. I still love vinyl. I yeah. still do. Well, that's the idea of this carving in stone. Like, what's going to last if things go haywire? You know, not to sound like an alarmist, but. People were almost killing each other for toilet paper not too long ago, you know? Like, <laughs> what? That is a big problem, yes, though. Yeah. So I'm stocked up. No, I'm just kidding. But it gets to the point where I'm like, what happens if for one week we don't have power? Yeah. You know, just comfort wise or, you know, how are people going to get around? I can't work. Yeah. Everything that I everything that I do is is on the internet. Well, don't feel like you're alone, even with regular working uh, jobs. Those are going to be affected too, not just people like us who are all online. It's going to be like people rely on the computer systems to make their whole business run. So, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good luck. Yeah, it's kind of freaky. So, so I don't know. I, I like the fact that even if everything blows up, I can, you know. You could be here. I could come here with my gas generator. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be the last thing I do because everyone will like, it'll turn into zombie world. But, and I'll, I'll go down like the movie um, Leave the World Behind. Have you seen that? I'll be no. watching Friends as the world explodes around. <laughs> See, we got the fr- fireplace. That's, that's our, oh, that's our, nice. our thing that we Not got. only can you stay warm, you can cook food. You can, yeah. wow. I'm coming over. <laughs> you know where to go. I need three. Plus, safe I have like 80 VCRs. I got nice. you know all the vintage stuff. I got I got almost everything on VHS. You know what we'll do? Sealed. We will start the next Columbia House from your basement. That sounds good, but it's all, all right. on VHS. That's okay. That's all. That's going to be. Think working. about how many pennies we'll make, and then how many people will get the tapes, and then not pay us the remainder. <laughs> and who's going to be our henchman? Corey Swap. No, I, I think that, um, I don't know, it's just, it's our ages, obviously, but there's a comfort in holding something and saying, you know. I, I like LPs because I like album artwork. I mean, I really do. I like I like actually looking at an album, and the artwork of it is always been something that's been important to me. You know, and even the, the sleeve, when you pull it out, yeah. if they got something on there, I like to look at that, too. Kiss had posters and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people did prints. Yep. Purple Rain comes with a poster in it, I found out, because I bought one at a, an estate sale, and then I open it up, and there's a, wow. a, a six-fold poster. There's something about grounding yourself in mm-hmm. this world that if you're in the digital realm all the time, which I'm in most of the time, mm-hmm. and it you go to bed, you feel like you... Eight 
empty calories. It's like you're not full, you know? And mm. I'm wondering why so many of people at my age grew up, we, we weren't on like psych meds. We weren't depressed, you know, at a really young age. I was later, but that had a lot to do with my love life. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where I was always full because I had music and guitar and I was always cultivating that stuff. And it felt real to me. Mm. When things get a little... Yeah, the joy comes from... I don't know. It's like a combination of all that. But growing up looking at an iPad that if the power goes out and it's black screen, if mm -hmm. that's your joy, that's going to be kind of a – how can you help – or how can you not feel anxious knowing that that is your source of everything? Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kindergartners on laptops doing their schoolwork. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, kindergartners. That's crazy. Oh, you should be learning how to tie your shoes. <laughs> and you should be learning colors. And you should be using your hands to They're do They're learning things. on YouTube how to tie their shoes or TikTok. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I got a TikTok video. You know what? Uh, there's a generation coming up called the toddler I iPad toddlers or something like that. I forgot what it's called. iPad this is kids. After Gen Z? Uh, yeah. I think it's Gen A now. Gen okay. Alpha, which is funny, yeah. Gen Alpha. But they're coming up being glued to a screen from day one. Yeah. So it's like, how's that going to go down? You know, so. <laughs> well, they're just going to, yeah. it's going to, they're going to eventually just have it and in, print it into their yeah. contact lenses. Well, and we lived it. We stood outside waiting to go into a, col a club in, in negative two degree weather, yeah. you know, stood outside waiting for tickets. We, <sighs> the, you know, the tsunami after the Guns N' Roses Metallica concert. Oh, God. We well, did you that. go to that? Yeah. Who would be your five? Definitely your, Mount, your Mount Rushmore plus one. Yeah, it's tough because, like, I, you know, I went through all the phases of the metal people. Mm -hmm. um, so Skullnick, Hammett. Uh, but I have to say Ace Frehley, you know, when I was first starting guitar, I was mimicking all his licks in my head, you know, pretending to play his stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, Satriani was a huge thing for me. But then I'll turn around and I'll get into, like, a bunch of country guitar players. Yeah. So it's just, like, hard to really pinpoint exactly where most of my influences come from. But, like, guys like Eric Johnson were huge for me. Steve Vai. Do you ever get in Jimmy Page? You know? Definitely, yeah. That stuff I couldn't help but be influenced by because of KQRS and my stepdad. Yep. So he got me into all the classics. You know, that's when I first heard Hendrix and Billy Hendrix. Gibbons and all those people. So I'm just a big culmination of everything I ever heard as a kid. You know, KQ played the same, you know, songs all the time, but <laughs> the Stones, the Beatles and all that kind of stuff. ZZ Top. And, yep. Yeah. But I really got into the Shred thing during the height of Shred. So it was like yep. Marty Friedman, Jason Becker. Anything from the shred shred guys, you know. Guys, what do you think of Dimebag? Huge man, like and he he allowed me to bend my technique to my own way. You know, like he he was a shredder at heart. Obviously, if you watch his old stuff, he's just Eddie Van Halen times hundred. You know. Yeah. But then he made it his own by you know putting that southern grit into it. Oh yeah, there was, was no sound like that when they fl started playing. So well, yeah. he used to do guitar competitions, and it was just a joke because he win every single one. <laughs> really? really, yeah, that's so funny. So that's no matter who you mention, I have a story of why they influenced me. That's why it's hard to really pin. Oh, that's great person. though. That's yeah. great though because you got like all these different influences that you can pull from at different times. I even got into this time when I was like getting into guitar players that weren't flashy at all because I wanted to learn how to be more musical and not just rely on techniques. So even a guy like Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, I'm like, oh, he plays like really memorable solos without having to be super flashy, you know? Mm. And how many instruments do you play? Um, Fluently. <laughs> if I jump on the drums, I feel great, you know? I played yeah. drums in a Foreigner tribute last year. Did you For really? two shows and then I quit. It's just, I was like... I had to get it out of my system. Too many head games. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny part about that song is we started playing it. I love that song. And then all of a sudden the singer got rid of it. Like, we're not doing head games anymore. I'm like, oh, this is weird, you know. <laughs> we're only doing things that people don't know. Yeah, like he wanted to do – I love the guy, but he was just like, do you really think we should do um, Waiting for a Girl Like You? Like, yeah, it's the biggest song. <laughs> it's the one that it's everyone really? knows. I think it's because he didn't like singing it. So he'd mm. like, oh, this isn't going to work out, you know, but. I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> and he wouldn't just admit, you know, I just don't like to sing the song or it's too high or whatever. You <laughs> I know, don't but, like this. But uh, bass, piano. Yeah. I played violin since like seventh grade, sixth grade. Yeah. I was wondering, did you have a band or orchestra influence when you started? Orchestra. My sister, it's the same story as my brother and the guitar. My sister would come home with her violin, go play with her friends. I would pick it up and play hot cross buns all night. You know? Yeah. And did you play in school? Yep. Okay. So uh, sixth grade, I was like second chair 
And they're like, of course, he's the Asian kid. He's going to be good. <laughs> and then in uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, I was still in it. And I liked it, but I was starting to wear metal shirts. And one day the teacher came in and I was playing Metallica on my violin with a pick. She goes, <laughs> Mike, you should probably just put your energies into the guitar. So. <laughs> And then, uh, what could you play? What song? Fade to Black. Oh, boom, boom, my boom, God. Boom, 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 boom. Because it's, it's pretty tune totally different, isn't it? Is yeah. It, yeah. It's a GDA. It's like backwards from a guitar. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got into cello. It's like almost any instru- accordion I love playing, uh, piano, I think I said. So I have a bunch of synths over there that I never touch. It's really sad, but I wanted to collect synthesizers for some reason. Yeah. Well, you, and you, you have an, an, I mean, I as well have a group of guys that you can look back on something that you did that was very epic. And it's like, a, it's, it's great. But then if you were to just be a solo artist, you'd be like, oh, that was fun. <laughs> you know, having those guys yeah. and having them back around recently still, is still alive and everything yeah you guys you know, are playing and you sound great too it's awesome it's weird you say that because i'm like going full circle in my life because <clears throat> early on i was always such a loner that i always wanted to get rid of people and be like leave me alone so i could do what i'm really interested in but now i'm seeing everything that i really value has to do with the other people and i think mick fleetwood said it one time best he's like you could do it yourself for sure but you're not going to want to like he was talking about like being in a band or Fleetwood Mac, being a solo artist. You could do everything yourself. It's going to be great, but you just don't want to in the end, you know. Mm-hmm. And it, you got nobody to look back on it with, and you got you yeah, know just sitting there with Alan Corey the other day. Like Al would say something I would have never thought of. He's mm-hmm. like, "Hey, th- that shirt you're wearing is this this?" And it's like they bring a different dimension into the the whole uh, story, and it's like, wow, with one person's story. It's one, it's one dimensional. Mm-hmm. You know? It might be interesting, but then you bring in Corey, and Corey's going to be you know, <laughs> yeah. funny and loud and all that stuff. And it's just like the the elements come together to form the the whole in a special way. Yeah, but the old me would have totally rebelled against that. Like, no way, man! I'm going Trent Reznor all the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure his best stories have to do with his bands too. So. Yeah, and that's the, I I I mean, it took me 25 years to realize it. You yeah. know, yeah. but yeah, that was that was really the best days to, to of the camaraderie, the the building something from nothing. You know, and and doing something with it. Yeah, the thing is, is like. The idea of being in battle together, even if it's not really battle, it's like, you know, that's why jujitsu people are so tight because you guys are every day, you know, risking your body and you're sweating and you're, you know, it's just afterwards you feel very close to everybody because of that. And I realized when I stopped teaching private lessons that I miss that camaraderie of one-on-one talking to someone, then the next person doing group lessons with people and feeling that. It's like, I think I'm going to go back to that someday. You know, I'm going to be like the old guy who's like, you sure you don't want to learn a Megadeth song? And they'll be like, what's, a Meg- what's a Megadeth? <laughs> what's a Megadeth? Yeah. So after the YouTube thing, you know, right now it's very singular, but I do like to bring other people into it. Yeah. It's, been, um, you made me get out of my basement, man. Yeah. I was miserable just sitting there doing the eBay stuff so i feel like um that's the biggest thing i can offer now is um an example of that it can work out if you keep going mm-hmm. and that it's possible to have an avenue you know from going from teaching only locally people like i, I was getting scared when guitar wasn't as popular i'm like i'm gonna have nobody to teach <laughs> to suddenly teaching the entire world if they tune in you know so yeah it's just exactly. an opportunity to reach and at any time yeah. that's that's amazing i wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and I go right now somebody might be watching my beginner video and learning guitar for the first time you know and then so, they could turn out to be the next joe satriani eventually yeah. Probably not, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hopefully, that'd be awesome. I think, think about that, it. I mean, the, the 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 only bummer, the only bummer about is of of this huge wide net that you have is you can't pinpoint and say, "Wow, yeah, I brought that guy to the show." Unless you know they contact mean? me, yeah, yeah, they're just out there. Yeah, you sure. know, I'm getting more and more people telling me, and it's like, oh, cool, because uh, it's I don't know. I think it takes a while, and people go, you know, just like with us. We look back and go, oh, Dave Yeager did all that for fun. Yeah. Now I want to thank him, you know, obviously. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. I want to buy him, like, a meal or something. Yeah, I'm going to take him out. We can all go out. Yeah. Make it a group effort. got to find him. Yeah. Dig him out. There's a couple people I got to find. <laughs> it's like, whatever happened to this guy? We used to have a sound guy that used to sleep under the stage at night. Whatever happened to him? His name was Lucky. Still there. Ironically, yeah. But. One real important question I got to ask. Five favorite John Cusack movies. They're all right over there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no looking. 
It's funny because um, I don't know five. That's a lot. But I actually love the movie called Adult World. Have you seen that one? No. It's like a newer movie. Newer, I mean, like in the 2000s. Yeah. But Emma Roberts is in it. It's so great. Um, but then uh, High Fidelity hit me at a very special time. A girl that I was in love with my whole, like, you know, teenage life. She told me about the book. She's like, the movie's coming out soon. And I remember because I watched the movie and I had the bias of knowing she likes the book. So I was like just gushing about the, the movie terror. I'm like, oh, I love that John, John Cusack was great. And then she goes, I actually kind of hated the movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, shoot. Maybe I should just be true to myself. And, you know, kinda, you know. I don't need to share that. Yeah. And then, of course, Say Anything, Better Off Dead. Those are yeah. classics, you know. I was trying to remember because the I Want My $2, kid. That's yeah. Better Off Dead, right? Yep, that's Better Off Dead. That's with the, the French fries. Yeah. That too, kid, bad, too bad Ricky's played by the horrible... Dan, dude. Oh, that, that's right. Yeah, uh, but yeah. out, outside of that, yep. awesome. Boogers in there. <laughs> Boogers. Boogers in there. It's like this whole this whole <laughs> mountain is covered in snow. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Boogers in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I watched uh, the other about two weeks ago. I watched One Crazy Summer oh, with yeah. Demi Moore. Yeah, that's right. It's so crazy. Of a... And then oh, Serendipity is actually sounds really s- sappy of me to say, but <laughs> I love that movie. With Jug, really? Like, yeah. So, okay. Kate Beckinsale's in it, and uh, you know they're in New York, and it just—I remember that time being so good. I think that was when I was first getting engaged, actually. So I yeah. was in love at the time, and uh, yeah, it's pretty much because of Kate Beckinsale, <laughs> <laughs> the right actress or actor. And Jeremy Piven right. was really good, at, I believe, in it too. So oh, Jeremy Piven—he plays a really good sidekick in that movie. I'm getting into this weird genre lately. Genre lately. Remember back in the early '80s when everybody wanted to be like Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> so like Excalibur, um, Clash of the Titans. Clash of the Titans. All I was just gonna say scary, that. Yeah, the Medusa those, head that yeah. he held up and the snakes are still going. Even though was that like claymation. Me. Yeah, but, but back it when was we were so kid, real back then. Just like yeah. Large Marge in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It looked like this. <laughs> Oh, Claymation yeah. looked real to kids for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I remember that. I remember him holding up the thing in yeah. the owl with its eyes moving yep. and stuff like so that. So many visceral yeah. moments when you're a kid. And yeah. I remember there was one scene where like he opened the gateway to hell and it was just oh my god, just Yeah. That and the Exorcist messed me up. Oh, I think, Exorcist most. messed me up. Yeah. Bad. We'll, we'll have to do like a that. podcast on horror movies someday, I think. Oh. Yeah, it's it's funny, you know, I did get catch the tail end of a certain generation teaching private lessons and I started to get a little more and more afraid each time about where it was headed, you know. But I think we're past the worst part. Mm-hmm. I think people are realizing that they have to get back to some real stuff and Yeah, I think COVID woke everybody up. Definitely. And I think yeah. Yeah, and I'm actually we're sitting here right now because COVID woke me up because you bought a TV VCR from me. That's so crazy. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I flash back to those days and go, how did we get through that? You know, like everything I did every day got condensed to just coming here, basically. Oh, really? So I had a whole series called um, Riffs that gave me the biggest chills. And I just kept doing those videos. They kept me sane, you know. <laughs> that and VR ping pong. <laughs> VR ping pong is awesome. Don't have but yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this uh, backstage community forum, Art of Guitar. I just realized I think I look like Rob Halford now looking at the, the camera. That's not. <laughs> oh my god, Rob Halford is awesome. He is, but there's a yeah. I just don't want to yeah. look like him necessarily right now. <laughs> Later, maybe. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Tay, thank you for yes. for you could running the running the, the camera. moving camera. Yes, you got to get it on there. It's been real. It's been fun. It's been real fun. (laughs) And we'll see you next time. Yes, we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Yes. Bye. I have no idea what to say.